<laughs> All right, Steph, it says you're going live. Okay, I think I'm there. Okay, I think, okay, there's everybody. Okay, am I live? Can you see it? It says you're live on Facebook. Okay, okay, hold on. Welcome, welcome, everybody to Just Face It radio show. Uh, well, internet show now, uh, a TV show, what have you, uh, in my house show. Here we go, here we go. I am super duper excited, and I am so grateful that you all have tuned in uh, to be with me on this special day. This is my first time doing the Zoom me thing, because, uh, you know, I've been doing live, trying to do live, you know, going to venues and doing live. But I reached out to this awesome, awesome panel of people uh, at the last minute. And I'm telling you, um, they all said yes. Uh, emphatically, they all um, said yes. And I am just super duper grateful um, that they are here. Who is, okay, that they are, that they are here. And I'm just gonna have, um, we're gonna do a word of prayer because our topic is extensive. I am totally overwhelmed. I was trying to narrow it, um, but it's just totally, we're just going to have a great uh, conversation. Um, and I'm just going to have everybody um, introduce themselves um, in a few minutes. Um, I have my uh, wonderful cousin, sweet cousin. She's going to sing a song that she wrote uh, called I Breathe um, in the midst of um, the chaos. So we're going to see how that works. She went all the way to her church. Um, to try to make um, this happen. I praise God for her pastor and dad, uh, Pastor Raymond Davis for um, taking her there. Uh, she just graduated from high school yesterday. Yes, our 2020 um, graduates. So we are excited about that. Um, but we're going to, um, I'm just gonna say a quick word of prayer and then I'm gonna toss it to our music guests and then we're gonna um, get into the business. I'm asking those of you who are watching on Facebook here that you would share, 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 share. Look at this panel. Look at this panel. Listen, they are from all walks of life with all kinds of experiences and they are bringing something to the table. I am just the if, and, and, but. These people have the meat um, on the table and they will be able to share with you. And I'm, um, I'm just gonna enhance what I know about them, but they're gonna tell you exclusively um, who they are and their titles and things of that nature. Kind of gracious Father God, we thank you right now uh, for this opportunity, oh God, and thank you for each individual that has joined this broadcast today. And God, we praise you, we love you, we thank you God that someone that we will all say something to enhance um, the atmosphere, oh God, to bless those who are watching, those who are looking God in the middle of this pandemic slash riot slash protest. God, we are thanking you right now um, that you will endow us with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we love you and help us to just face it. And God, we love you, thank you and praise you. And we give you honor in Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody's muted out for now, but um, uh, uh, just kind of tried to give a little disclaimer. Uh, sometimes we will override each other for the sake of conversation. That's cool. Um, but we only have you on mute in case your dog run in or uh, somebody ring the doorbell or your husband call you or your wife 
uh, want to come get you your kid running in, that kind of thing. So at this time, Raven, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Raven is going to um, sing, and she wrote this um, called I Breathe. Is your dad there? Is he going to say? Yep. Okay. Um, Pastor Raymond Davis is going to come right now and introduce his wonderful daughter. Uh, again, she just graduated. Tell us where you graduated from, Raven. I graduated from Cousin O Senior High School. And you're headed where for college? I'm going to Bethel University in Minnesota. In, in where? Minnesota. Oh, my. Okay. Oh, amen. Yeah. Is it another location anywhere? <laughs> we'll, 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 talk about, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that later. I didn't know. Okay, where's your, where, where's Pastor Davis? And listen, you know it's no holds barred. So, um, uh, okay, there's Dad. Dad, tell us how did this song come about and and talk to us. Uh, this song came about uh, during the times of, um, that we're living in right now, and uh, we're just tired of people saying I can't breathe, and. Um, and my daughter, uh, amazing, uh, amazing and talented, she wrote this song and she wrote the, the poem at the end of the song as well. And, and she just, she's all that. Amen. Praise God. She did what she did. <laughs> and, um, and I believe that everybody's going to enjoy it. And it's something um, um, that is for um, not only Black people, but I believe it's something for all people as well. So... Um, I'm going to step aside so y'all can enjoy. Okay. All right. Thank you, Raven, so much for um, doing this. And God bless you on your writing skills. You're super talented. Thank you. And again, this is called I Can't Breathe. Okay. He said he can't breathe, but I'm here. Why are you trying to kill me? It's already in that cup. Truth is, I'm to the knees of the cup. We need justice for every life that was lost. Oh, my. Can't breathe. Don't ignore me. I know you heard me say I can't breathe. Eric Gardner, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Philando Castile, Trayvon Martin, Emmett Hill, and all the other names of the We get to have any sympathy. We get to have any empathy. Yet there's still no equality between you and me. What doesn't define me is the color of my skin or the way my body is thick or thin. And still then, you hold a closeness to my image and make your judgment off my race. Being black should not be a burden. We are beautiful kings and queens is what we should be learning. Not how we have to hide and turn from racist junk. I know for a fact you heard Sandra Bland scream. People acting like they couldn't hear her. In other words, orange is a new black, but black is the new green. Green as in money. How about you pay an equal amount between a white and black man for doing the same thing? It ain't fair how we have to worry about our young black man driving, our young black man walking and minding their business because the police are careless. We as a whole try to act fearless, like our soul faces are fearless. It ain't fair how you tell black men to stop stagging, but to be us physically and mentally until we are realists. But remember this, black people, raise your forearm and show both wrists so they can see you're a clean man and not less than. Even though, we're judged by Even though you're judged by white America, don't let it bring you down, bro. Just stand tall and remind them that we'll fight and we'll rise. Even though we're just black in their eyes, this ain't fair, but we ain't going nowhere. Thank you. All right, all right. Very good. Very it's on good. iTunes. It's on YouTube, and I think it's on Spotify as well. 
Um, my name is Raven LaShawn, R-A-Y-V-E-N-L-A-S-E-A-N, and the song is titled, I Can't Breathe. All right, Raven, thank you so much. And before you go, Raven, how did you come up with that poem? Was that something that you wrote before or you was oh, inspired yeah. by um, the infant? Before my dad even came to me about the idea of this song, I had this poem wrote like a year ago. I wrote it when I was in like the 10th or 11th grade. Wow, that's perfect. And then all the new names of the, um, new people who had passed away from racism and police and all that stuff, I, I have to add that in when I had made the song. Okay, perfect, perfect. But well, we want it to go viral, go global, because uh, it's definitely befitting uh, for this time. Thank you, Raven. Thank you. And we'll talk more about where you're going to school. Um, <laughs> but I believe that you'll be a catalyst for change um, in Minnesota. I believe that. And, and we're going to um, pray God's protection um, over you going to Minnesota. How ironic is this? Right. Wow. All right, everybody, let's get right down to it. I'm just going to have uh, everybody just um, briefly introduce themselves. Now, I want my Facebook family, I'm hoping that those of you who are on are sharing um, as well. I want my Facebook family to know that every individual that you see on this page is capable of being a show by themselves, okay? They are all capable of ha handling two hours at best by themselves. So this is going to be interesting and we're gonna just play um, off of each, other, um, each other's knowledge and what we experience. So I'm gonna start with the patriarch who happens to be my, um, he has the wonderful opportunity of doubling as my pastor and dad. And if you just introduce yourself. Unmute, 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 unmute. Uh, yeah, all this is new to him. Uh, oh, where did he go? Mama, I'm gonna come back to you. Go down to the bottom, bottom all the way left and hit that mute. Okay, I'm a, okay, there you go. <laughs> Hold on. My name is Pastor Marshall Hall, Pastor of New Foundation Christian Center, and thanks, Stafford, for having me on. That's it? Okay. That's it. All right, amen. Come on, Sherry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sherry Nunberry. I'm I sort of have a dual career. The first being I'm a director for chemical biological equipment for the U.S. Army uh, product support. So I sustain chemical biological um, equipment for the U.S. Army, a director over about 160 uh, multicultural group, um, including engineers, maintenance managers, supply inventory managers. Um, so I've been there about 30, 31 years now. So I've been doing that. So I've reached executive um, level there. And then I also serve as a um, praise and worship leader and choir director. So sort of a dual career um, where I also get an opportunity to do that as well. Amen. Thank you. Come on, doctor. Yeah. Me? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Sabrina Jackson, the people expert, as I help people with people, even if that person is themselves. And I got that name from Staffy. Yes, she named me the people expert. But I do what I do in a myriad of ways. I am a keynote speaker. I do a lot of work around diversity and corporations, Fortune 500 companies around the world. And I just finished my training and have been appointed a peace ambassador to the UN. So I am doing some global things. I'm working with some people in Pakistan. It's just, just, and then you can find me on Fox too a couple of times a week. <laughs> All right. Yes. Come on, Elder Day. Uh, Charleston Day. Um, Founder and director of It's in the Mail Boys program, also the uh, director for City Life Detroit, the only urban paper community center. 
uh, in the city of Detroit, as well as the director for Ju juvenile justice. Um, also part of the 18th prison fellowship, we have done over close to 90 prisons across the country, uh, doing music on different platforms. And uh, I pastored the Road Church uh, alongside my beautiful wife here in the city of Detroit. All right, come on, beautiful wife. Here's the beautiful wife. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am a Sunny Day singer, songwriter, and vision strategist. Um, as my husband mentioned, we pastor the Road Church uh, in Detroit, right down from New Foundation Christian yes. Center on Finkel in the Schaefer area. Um, I'm also a uh, platform artist and speaker um, inside of prisons with um, a couple of prison organizations throughout the country. And um, I work with teen girls and uh, that's about it. All right, all right. Pastor Sanders. All right, good evening, good evening, good evening. I am so honored to be on here. Um, looking at here, it looks like I know just quite a few people on here. It's great, great people. Um, people that have influenced me over the years. So it's great to be on here to, with you all. I'm the assistant pastor of the Boulevard Church here in Pontiac. Uh, been here for about seven years. Moved back from Ypsilanti. Um, host and producer of Katie's Inspire Media, uh, Monday through Friday at 725. Um, just inspiring people every day and motivational speaking and working with the city of Pontiac, doing a lot of things with our young people throughout Metro Detroit and um, trying to get these kids in the right mindset, especially with what's going on now. And so uh, it, is a, it is an honor to be on here with you all. I'm looking forward to seeing what God is going to do. All right. And last but not least, well, I think, yeah, um, Pastor Devin. Hello, everyone. Pastor Devin Goff. Hey, Sherry. I mean, your voice sound good, even on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> This don't make no sense, but so honored to be with you. I pastor Revival Tabernacle in Highland Park, the Purple Church on Woodward. And uh, anytime I can be in a Zoom room with Dr. Hall, I feel I've been upgraded in my life. So thank you so very much, Staffy, uh, just for allowing me to be a part of this great aggregation. I love the Road Church. My grandfather pastored a church not too far from there on Finkel and Lashore. Uh, for over 60 years. And so I was very familiar with the work going on there by uh, Team Day and Day. And of course, uh, Sabrina, I have met her and her son uh, at, at our church for a community fair and she read me like a book. So I can, I can, I can attest she is the people's people. <laughs> and of course, my friend and brother, Kevin Sanders, just so proud of everything that he is doing and just how he's availing himself to be a change agent for our next generation, but also our older generation. He is a bridge and I appreciate his work as a general in the faith. So thank you, Staffy. And I, oh, I can go on and on about you, but I just- <laughs> Go ahead, we have time. We have I time. think y'all know how I feel about Staffy. I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for Staffy. I, oh. I say that publicly. Wow. And anything that I can always do to support her uh, in her endeavors, I would do. Forgive me for rocking a hat. Uh, I didn't want to be unprofessional, but I've been in, my hair has been on quarantine, y'all. So I'm trying to make sure we make sure we can keep people focused on what we're talking about and not distract yes. how I'm looking. How about that? Oh, you should have seen what I had to do to get her to lay down. And uh, I didn't got I got makeup on some of the gray. I still didn't get it, but I just said it is what it is. <laughs> now I don't know who eight oh nine three five. I don't. Who are you? Hello? I don't know who that is, but okay, we're gonna keep moving on. Well, um, those of you who are watching, um, I posed a question um, on uh, fake, on, on, uh, as our topic, after the protest, then what? And I believe they are in the 14th day, 13th or 14th day of protest. And um, I just wanna give, um, just a little history and then we're gonna um, span from there because uh, what's crazy is uh, what's crazy is uh, uh, the what has happened with George Floyd he really is not the first 
And when I did the research, I, I was just blown away because I just was not really into um, uh, this kind of thing. We've heard about um, the Trayvons and because I have a son, I have to really pay attention to that. But listen to this. And, and then I, I went back to like 2015. In 2015, there were 104 cases like um, George Floyd, all different kinds of things. Uh, and when I say like him, I'm meaning police who killed um, innocent people or, or people who were being accosted. Um, uh, out of the 104, only four cases on um, the police were charged. Um, two of those cases were acquitted. And one of those cases, the police only did about six months and they found a loophole um, to get him out. So out of 104, and that was just 2015. So out of 104 cases, only it was really only one officer um, that was um, taken into custody. And so with that being said, I went back to 2014, same thing. There are a ton of names that we have never heard of that was never mentioned that we did not uh, protest about. So I pose the question to you all, what do you all think caused us? Now, so, some of the things we're gonna say to those of you who are watching on Facebook uh, may make you feel uncomfortable, but these are uncomfortable times. And so we will say black, we will say white, which I um, always said that those were, um, uh, for some reason we just had, uh, we were just not comfortable with saying those words. So I will ask you all, what do you think it was that sparked international worldwide protest um, based on George Floyd, aside from the obvious, considering that we've had maybe, uh, I counted maybe over 205 cases uh, of people that we didn't even know about that did not um, get this kind of uh, recognition. Anybody that wanna come in? Anybody? Well, I'll just, I'll jump out there and say, for me, uh, of course, racism and police brutality is not new. Um, but this particular case, because they showed the duration of what happened on tape, and people were able to see it, and they were able to see it before they saw it on the news. And so once people started to see it, it really went viral, and it went viral around the world. And I think also um, with him not struggling at all, and him being um, handcuffed and on his belly, and the man's knee on his neck, and the man constantly saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And the, none of the police officers, the four of them, none of them attempted to make sure he could breathe. And the gentleman who's, um, I forgot his name, um, who had his knee on his neck, his, he had his hand in his pocket. He was so, you know, like, hey, what? <clears throat> like, you know, it was so, I, it's like it was worth it. I've seen people have more of emotion for a dog than they did for this man. And so I know I saw beyond the um, piece where he was on his neck and they, someone came and took his pulse. And when they took his pulse, there was no pulse, but the man still did get off his neck. Wow, I didn't see that. Oh yeah, I saw that. And wow. so you see the whole duration of what happens from the time that he's put in that position to the time that they finally put him on the gurney. Oh my. Yeah, I've seen it to that point. So, so I think that, that because we literally seen somebody die and this was not the movies. We literally seen somebody die before our very eyes. I think that's what sparked the outrage. I think that it's that and the fact that it was so close to the Aubrey case where the gentleman in Georgia was jogging and the two men decided that they were gonna do civil arrest and shot him and, you know, and had that on tape. And then the Brianna Taylor piece, uh, with her being shot and killed in her own home. So yeah. I think that that's a culmination and it happened like boom, boom, boom. And I think that on top of the fact that we 
been in this pandemic state, we've been in this state that we are anxious just about our own lives and being in the house that people are at a, already at a heightened state and now this. So mm. yeah. Wow, wow. I think it was the perfect storm as they say. Yeah, yeah. Pastor Hall, let me ask you because um, uh, I think you're um, maybe our senior member um, that, that's on here. Let's let's go back and then we're gonna come back. Let's go back to, uh, because I remember stories of you all talking about picking cotton and uh, you may remember the riots of 67. Talk a little bit about that. Well, one of the things, uh, Sister Affie, is that I think enough is enough. I've seen the sign of so many saying enough is enough. And piggyback on what uh, Sister Jackson is saying is sometimes people were tense. We were pressured to a point. Now, if we went back into history uh, where I grew up, um, grew up in the years of um, a lot of the old violence, which was uh, one of the things that we didn't worry about too much um, because it wasn't as plentiful and it wasn't as bad as people really say it was in the South. Um, we had a few lynchings, but it was far and in between. Nothing was back to back like that. So when you get cases back to back, you find that it's a tension that goes into all people. People start to fear, fear builds tension. And when we were growing up, we didn't, uh, to the what's next, after all of this that we've gone through and if we've seen it all, people go right back to doing the same thing because of the injustice sometimes that is not given as it should be. So they go back and we go back. I, 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 I we, what we did in those days was we were strong. Um, I would say the black race, of people were much more together than they are even right now. Even though uh, it looks like we are more together, we didn't march and protest and a lot of things. We boycotted. And if they said uh, to one black person and to the black community, do not spend your money in this place or with these people, it was done. Those people were driven out of business because they, their living was made on black back. So, and black money. So if the things like that happen, our solution in that time was to just don't spend our money with them. But in this generation now and where we're living now, it's going to be difficult to get the younger generation not to spend money. They'll loot, they'll riot and all of that. But to stop spending money is the way to really uh, bring justice, I would say, because the only way to I think it is to really get justice um, from the outside of the prison and outside of the courtroom is keep your money. Uh, mm -hmm. When Blacks stop spending their money um, just wisely and foolishly, um, you'll find that things will begin, to, I believe things will begin to change. If we keep spending our money and going through the same thing, the same thing will keep happening. Uh, you have to you have a different solu a solution for certain results. I mean, sometimes people say, well, we just do this, we throw it off. After a while, we sweep it under the rug. Nobody be talking about it, it'll all be over. And we go back to doing the same thing. So uh, my, my uh, take on this is to, for us to learn to stick together and keep our money in our pocket. That's what they did. That's what we did in the days back. Uh, we kept our money. We didn't, the little bit that they had, they kept it. They would not spend it until things would change. Mm -hmm. I grew up in an area where there was a black water fountain, where the black water fountain was the water hose. And they had a water fountain. You had to go to the back door or to get a hamburger where they could go in, sit down and eat a hamburger. And and the thing that, that, that my parents taught me, if they don't want you in there, don't go in there. Keep your money. You don't have to go to the back door. You can go home and get a hamburger. So this is the this is what needs to, I think, needs to take place. We need to come together and actually learn how to what is the strategy that we need to use in order to prevent and stop a lot of this uh, pro police brutality. 
That's, that's, that's one of the things that I would say. Okay. Uh, did you all know in 2013, we spent, I'm talking about us black folks, we spent $1 trillion and it was not, you know, houses. It was uh, gym shoes and purses and hair and, and stuff like that. $1 trillion African-Americans only we spent, what do you all feel? Do you all feel that, uh, and I think Devin, I'll ask Devin because we talked a little bit about the looting because I have some Caucasian friends that could not understand why with the rioting or with the protesting, why were we looting and why were we burning stuff up? Um, Devin, you wanna address that? Well, so much is, oh, so much good stuff has already been said. But specifically to that is that, you know, when you look back at the history of riot and when urban riots began, we understand that it wasn't that we were so much concerned with taking people's stuff. It was the, in, or the level of importance or the level of priority that they placed their stuff above people's lives. And so the best way that we as black folk or, or urban riots began to get the attention of the people who were oppressing them is to go after their property. If you value your property over people, then guess what? I'm going to destroy your property since you're destroying my life. And so um, I think that's what we began to see unfold um, once again here in this present day sense with the you know, I mean, I'll just call it out the public lynching of George Floyd. And you're right, it wasn't the first, but I think it was the one that we were able to really visualize for the entire time. I mean, it's one thing when you see someone get shot, a bullet can take them out. But when you literally are putting your hands, and in this case, a knee, something of your body and taking out suffocating another individual, um, I think what we begin seeing as the outcry of it, I think it is equivalent to what we saw or what we read about uh, in the Bible when Cain slew his brother Abel and that the blood began to cry out from the ground. We literally present day because of the vastness of social media began to see blood literally cry out from the ground and it began to be heard all across the globe. So this became uh, the second global pandemic that we were facing as black America both on the fronts of, of COVID-19, but also in the thrust of the, 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 the injustice that uh, I think Will Smith said, it's not that racism is getting worse, it's just getting filmed. And so we're seeing this just in, 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 in droves and at a heightened level of awareness, um, which you know is just problematic on so many different fronts. I agree with what Dr. Hall said. It was something that we've heard people talk about in terms of pulling our money out. Uh, to make sure that 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 they can feel the impact and and so that they know listen you can't just take not only black dollars for granted but black lives for granted mm -hmm. uh the biggest thing that i think in coupling with that um that we can do proverbs 29 and 2 says when the righteous are in authority the people rejoice but when the wicked are are, are, are ruling here's what happens the people groan Right mm -hmm. now, we're hearing a lot of groaning going on and not a lot of rejoicing. And the reason is, is because we don't have righteous people in authority. We have wicked people in authority. Yeah. And so until we can really energize our generations, and this is multi-leveled, it's not just on the backs of the millennials or the Gen Zs. Everybody can play a part in getting active and engaged in public service, uh, because that is where we will begin to see an, an effect or, or influence real change. So that's what I would say to that. Wow, wow. Uh, Sherry, uh, I'll ask you because I think you're in a uh, real strategic position uh, for your job and you've held it for 31 years. Yes, hallelujah. And um, the military side of things. Um, and we've heard stories about uh, racism um, in the military, um, putting us on the front lines from back in the day. Uh, what effects or, or what have you witnessed, if you can say, 
or if you can even talk about it, or what have you experienced um, um, being a leader and uh, a, a, a double minority, if you will, being a woman and being a black woman in um, the military? Because right now, our military is on the front lines in terms of police is a form of military. And um, so talk about your experience um, and where you are. So, um, I mean, there's so much, uh, as, as Pastor Devin said, that's been said already, but um, the military has its own culture as well. Um, nothing that happens in, in everywhere else throughout the United States, throughout the world, is not prevalent in the military. Um, all of the same issues that are there are there uh, um, as well as in the military. Um, I think we're seeing the evidence of, as Dr. Jackson said, the perfect storm. Um, people were home. Um, I want to just add to that, you know, the military is probably one of the greatest offenders of a lot of things, of the, of the, the prejudice, of the sexual assault. You know, that's something that we've studied intensively with the military. Um, so there's a lot because with the military that's different from all of us, they are always in that combined, com, um, confined space. And so a lot of the things that we've seen manifest now have always been in the military, but some of them have been guarded because of um, just the rules of the military. Mm. Um, but when, when Dr. Jackson was talking about the perfect storm, I think one thing that, that made this so much more intense is everybody's home. Everybody could see it. It was very prevalent. Um, and, and, you know, it wasn't as if we had had back to back to back things and we're all home. The first being the pandemic hit our communities far greater. I mean, so we already know we that was a suffer. That was a impact from systemic racism. That our healthcare was poor. That our health itself is different. Um, so all of those things were already a pressure. Then you add this. Okay, so now you're killing us one way, and then we come back, and now you're gonna kill us. We're gonna watch you kill us another way. Mm. And so it, it. I think that um, it was that perfect storm. And so a lot of things happen um, as they are in the military. It's prevalent everywhere. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that you talked about and, and Pastor Hall talked about was, you know, I feel like what we're seeing now is the faith. But now it's time for the work. Mm -hmm. You know, what he's talking about, putting our financial dollar to work, that's the work. Because faith without the work is dead. So that's what we've seen so far. It's, it hasn't been manifested because if we don't put the work behind it, it's, it's kind of a dead issue. Yeah. Uh, same thing. One thing that I've noticed with uh, being in corporate, with civilian workforce, um, and have worked so long, for me, one of the things that I think is very prevalent is that they will promote me as a Black female before they will a Black man. Oh. And I think that is um, a part of that systemic racism that we've seen for 400 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that they have always, um, you know, and that's, that's Sherry's opinion, but I think that it, it can be justified statistically um, yeah. of what you see. Not, I'm not talking about in just a job. I'm talking about in the executive ranks like I am. Mm -hmm. um, that you see a difference in that. So, um, I mean, I could talk about this all day, but I'll, I'll give way to someone else. But have you felt the pressure uh, from your own people because of your promotions? Absolutely, absolutely. We, we get it from, from outside as well as from inside mm -hmm. um, because we still have to toe the line of being more than qualified, which means that when I hire you, you must be and I hold you to a standard that I expect and that I, but sometimes we expect our own kind to give us that break and do things for us. Um, and we, we aren't upholding our part of the, of the end of the, uh, uh, of, of what we should. Be. So yes, I've seen all of it. I've seen it from both sides. Um, but you know, one of the things, uh, you, we have to be accountable for what we do. And mm -hmm. so sometimes that means we lose friends of both races because uh -huh. of our accountability. 
and our responsibility. You know, I, I, I manage chemical biological equipment for the Army. That's a big responsibility. And so I have to make sure that that's my, that I'm a good steward over what God has put me in charge of. That's huge. That's, 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 so you can mix some stuff up and get rid of all of us. <laughs> uh, I can't, but I know the folks that can. <laughs> Listen, I'm, what I'm doing is bringing all subjects in before we try to compile and find a, an answer. Um, I, I want everybody to understand um, everybody's uh, professions, if you will. Kevin, 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 uh, yeah. Kevin is, and him and I talk, because here's a question that I posed, and this is gonna segue to Sunny Day and Elder Day. I posed a question and, and um, I had invited somebody, which uh, this is a, a, a series, y'all. We will be doing more tomorrow. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, but I posed a question, are black people, do we hold any responsibility to what's happening now? And oh, it, 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 it went up in flames. And I say that because um, what do white people see us as? You know, we wear our pants low, we're, uh, uh, it's black on black crime. We have not had a huge march or, or protest because Pookie killed Ray Ray. It was as well, Pookie killed Ray Ray. We have not had a big outcry, and I'm not saying that that has never happened, but it has never been this big based on white and black. So I asked Kevin, and him and I talked about it a little bit. Kevin is the only, uh, and ironically, uh, Sherry attends a multicultural church. Um, Devin pastor began, started as a multicultural church and, be, and became the pastor. Kevin currently is the only black person in his church. And I'm wondering, Kevin, if you can, uh, if you're willing to share the pressures that you're feeling and what are your expectations of that church um, talking to you or talking about the situation? Well, I mean, it's a very good question. And uh, I'm gonna let you know right now, I'm shaking like crazy. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm a step lightly with this because I see a lot of the members that are watching right now. But um, respectfully, I'll, I'll be careful of my, my words when I say this. Uh, I've had conversations with them, especially with what's going on right now. Um, the members of the church, uh, the, just the members of the church of God. Um, a lot of them, a lot of pastors in the church of God have actually reached out to me and say, you know, they, they've apologized, but I'm like, you don't have, need to apologize. Let's just act on it. Um, but they've shared their concern and they've shared their, their feelings and, but they asked some questions. And I, and I think I have a very open door policy when it comes to questions being asked. Um, and they, <laughs> let me just throw it out there with them. One of the questions that they stated was why is it that uh, black people are protesting over this situation, but they're not protesting when they kill each other. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a very, very, good question to ask, along with some other questions. Um, they made a statement that, you know, that all, all white people are not racist, just because a couple are, or a group are, a group may be. And so it, this whole situation has, hope, has opened up a dialogue and has it allowed me to, to really define where I am, um, being part of, you know, I grew up Baptist, uh, missionary Baptist, so I'm the, the, the predominantly black church is what I've known. But in 2013, when I transitioned into a predominantly white denomination, um, I didn't see color. Uh, I just saw the spirit of God and I saw the move of God. And so I didn't even think about color. It wasn't until later on when I got ordained in the church of God that I went and looked up at the history. And when I saw the history of the church of God, and I mean, it, it, for a young black man, it could be. It's, it's rough. Uh, there was even times during the ordination period that I literally questioned God. And I said, I don't, are you sure you want me to get into this? Uh, because historically it was just not very favorable to African-Americans. And so now, um, of course it is international and there are more African-Americans joining, but I still feel like sometimes being honest, I still feel like the, the elephant in the room um, I have my moments where I just try to 
uh, try to blend in. But what, what changes it is when you're in the spirit of God and when you're flowing in the spirit of God, you no longer see color. That's now this is from my perspective. Um, and I, when you amongst true worshipers, I ain't just talking about people that's just lifting their hands and clapping. <laughs> but when you amongst true worshipers that love God for real, that love of God is demonstrated. It cancels out the racism. It cancels out the prejudice. Um, it, every concern and every fear and every worry that I had was erased because I've been connected to people that really love God for real. And they love God so much that they don't they don't demonstrate. And I got my family. Let's just be real and be transparent. My family, I got family members and friends. I'm in the city of Pontiac. OK, predominantly Baptist, black Baptist churches. I got family friends that ask me all the time, Kevin, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> Kevin, you know, I, and even while this is going on, I have people say, Kevin, we want to watch out for your safety. And are you OK? And this and that. And I said, y'all, I'm not I'm not dealing with that. And I can't explain to you why, but there is some hesitant. You can you can see a shift in conversations. You can see a shift in um, approaches like, should I say this? Is it OK? I've had people say, Kevin, before I ask you this, is it OK to talk about this? And so what what has this done? It has made people some people that that was never racist a day of their life. It has even made them sensitive on how to approach an African-American that they see every week. So now, now we're walking on eggshells. So now I have to be the one to open that door and say, I'm not looking at you uh, in the same category as everybody else. I want to have this dialogue because if I'm a worship with you and if I'm a be in the word with you, I also need to know where your heart is. So if having these kind of dialogues, maybe this, God, this is a season where I believe that God is exposing the true heart of many races, I got chill bumps when I just said that, Lord Jesus, uh, people that you would have never expected mm. are starting to come out of the wood with, whoa, putting things on their Facebook, um, things, and you're like, whoa, where did this come from? The people, the very people that you did not expect are the ones where you're starting to see the true colors, mm. and it's hurtful as, as, a, as a ministry leader, as, you know, it's hurtful to say, Lord, how do I still love? How do I still preach? How do I still worship? How do I still praise when I know and I've seen the heart of some people that do not like this? Yeah, that's that's a challenge for me. And so yeah, yeah so I, I I pray, and I try to stay in prayer, but I I try not. I'm be I try not to let the flesh get in the way because I say, God, you're gonna win this, you know. And I, I say it all the time, Lord, you're gonna win this. If I gotta be the one to love you so much, knowing that you're racist, knowing that you got a lot of prejudice in you. I'm going to love you so much, but I said, God, you got to help me do this because it's a learning experience, but the door is being open. Wow. 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 The, I have a thousand and one questions for you because it's like, for me, why would you continue worshiping in a place and you say you're shaking just to even answer um, these questions? I'm not going to push you because you got to go back Sunday. Well, you know, let me, if I could say this, I... I only had one in the 13 years. No, I'm sorry. In the in the seven, eight years I've been with the church, uh, the two churches that I've served in, I've only had one person, only one person that was bold enough. It will be a cold day in hell before a black man pastors the church of God. Wow. And this man was actually in his 70s, 80s. Okay. I looked at him and I smiled. Uh, I smiled. But I went to my office and I broke down. And I said, Lord, you better give me some confirmation because I, I grew up at Welcome Baptist Church. I was about to head back over to Welcome. And the Lord says, you got to face this. You got to face. The Lord calls me like the President Obama of the Church of God. I don't know. You know, you got to face this. You can't keep running. And so this this pen this 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 cultural pandemic because we were already in one pandemic now we're in a cultural pandemic. This is the time where people like me, in a very uncomfortable position, this is the time where this this is the best time to educate. Maybe there are some other, they just need to be educated. They don't know who we are. They don't know what they only know what they see on TV, what they see in the movie what they hear in music, but 
have they have they spent time to get to get a relationship with who we are? That's that's the problem. They don't. There's no relationship. There's assumption, and those assumptions is what builds up all these different stereotypes. There's no relationships. Wow, wow. Well, I'm gonna come back to you, Kevin. And so, Steffi, can I interject one thing about what Kevin just said? Yeah. He talked about he was talking about relationship, and we have to take every opportunity to to develop relationships because they really don't. You think about it. Um, the, the other notes, uh, Dr. Jackson, Staffy, and I, we were in college all together at the same time. And so we came from very, you know, somewhat the same background, but different backgrounds. Um, and we have to have the opportunity to come together in relationships. Mm. How do you change things if we're all going to stay in our own little group, our own little community, our own little room? our own little church where we never diversify. Where do you start to change if they don't develop relationships? So Kevin is, Pastor Kevin is developing relationships that hopefully will lead to what needs to happen. That's mm -hmm. the work. You know, we have the faith. We talk a lot. We talk a lot about scripture. We talk a lot about Bible. And I get exactly what he's saying because I'm in a multicultural church and Sometimes you won't say things because of fear, but other times you know that God has an assignment for you to do. It's just like when Dr. Jackson was talking about being an ambassador. You can't be an ambassador and go and talk to one type of people. Yeah. You got to be able to go across the board and know how to talk to all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that if you just stay in one little spot and you never broaden your yeah. thinking, your expectations, your opportunities, your relationships, your, your vocabulary, all those things. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to lead to changing some things. So I just wanted to say, um, encourage Kevin because he might be the catalyst to helping somebody make a real change and not just a faith. We talk a lot of faith, but actually put some work behind the faith. Yeah, he really needed to hear that. He really needed to hear that. Wow. Awesome. And ironically, um, Sherry, me, Sherry, and Sabrina were roommates, sweet mates. And uh, I remember our first year, uh, we had a white sweet mate <laughs> who had never um, seen Black. She grew up way up somewhere, had never seen Black people, wanted to touch our hair, wanted to touch my hair. It was crazy because she had stereotypes about what she saw. She was afraid. Uh, but I'm going to leave it right there, but she was afraid of us as Black women because she had never been in our company. So uh, uh, Kevin is taking some bullets for us, and we do have to step outside. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going in the direction because the days, and I, I pose the question, uh, is our culture, the African-American culture, are we somewhat responsible for what's happening? And they deal with the prison system. Um, they do a whole lot of things, but I really focus on that because they have decided to deal with people who uh, uh, we've kind of thrown away or once they're gone, they're gone. Uh, remember me not, I, I can't remember how you guys put that, uh, but either one of you can come in or both of you can come in together and um, just talk about do you think we're responsible based on um, the, the children? You predominantly have dealt with youth um, and, and you've watched the prison mentality be instilled in them. When, and, and somebody told me that because tomorrow we're going to do um, the Willie Lynch breakdown with uh, Bishop Corletta Vaughn. And I went and read that today and I, I couldn't read it all at the same time. And what I see the two of you doing working uh, in the prison system, you see the beginnings of a lot of the um, systematic things that's happening to our culture. Now talk about that. The days, either one of you. I guess he's letting me go first, I would guess. <laughs> um, well, I mean, for me, with what's going on right now, I would not say that we are responsible for what is taking place when it comes to police brutality. Um, I can go back to Emmett Till. He was not responsible for his death. This is a heart issue and it deals with the fact of just flat out racism. 
and it's hatred in the hearts of people. And when people don't understand you or have an experience from you, they don't understand the convictions that, that you may have, they may never have because they don't have those same um, type of cultural, cultural issues that they're dealing with. And so when I, when I see, I mean, I've heard a lot of people say, well, you know, with black on black crime, blah, 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 but there's crime in every community. And black, there's no such thing as black on black crime because there's white on white crime. It deals with the fact that we're all, if you're in living within one um, concentrated community, then your crime is gonna happen against people that look like you. And so if white people are in their own community, that crime is gonna happen to another white person. So it's, it's, and I think we've been labeled with that. And unfortunately, as a people, we've taken that on and we've adopted that mentality and it has become systematic because we throw that up every time something happens in the black community, we use that, well, black people don't do this for black people. Well, white people don't do it for white people either. So um, it's the same thing. And when it comes to our, our young people, um, I think it's vital and I really thank God for the millennials right now because they're the ones who are driving this protest. Um, you have some older people that are out there, but the ones that are consistently doing it, that are doing it for real, these are young people. And this is not just in this country, they're in other countries. Um, there's a young lady, um, I can't remember where she's from, but she has over 4 million followers on social media at the age of 17 as an activist in her country and she doesn't look like us, but she's fighting for these same issues that is taking place. And so I think, um, I, don't, I don't think that we should um, kind of use the fact of the situation because so many people are using this situation to capitalize off of it. Um, but I don't think as a people, we should use this situation to say um, that we possibly could have caused this. I don't think we caused police brutality because it's been going on since the 60s and prior to that. And the people did nothing to have dogs sicked, sicked on them and, and being beaten. All they were doing was trying to get the same equality rights that's in the constitution that we all supposed to have. And mm. until we get to that point of that, I think that's what we're marching for. I think that's what people are using their platforms for all we want as a people is equality. How hard is that? I don't, I mean, I don't understand the whole, the whole just of, of why this is happening for so many decades. And all we want to do is be created equal because we didn't write the constitution. Somebody else wrote it. Yeah. And if you wrote it in there, then why is it that we don't get a chance to experience that? And so um, as a generation with us, with us going in and inside of the prisons and into um, the juvenile systems, there's so many systems that has already created this place called prison for our people. So mm -hmm. until we get an understanding of the injustices that's already in place, that a lot of people have been fighting boots on the ground, grassroots organizations, been fighting for this stuff for years, but it took this situation, I believe, no different than Emmett Till's mother opening up that casket and letting the world see what hatred looked like. That's mm -hmm. what that video was for us to see that, what hatred looked like in, in the 21st century in the year 2020. And I believe that's why it exploded. And I believe that's why as, as people that work with, with, with this generation and these young people, they are fearless and they won't back down for nothing. And yeah. it's up to us as as the ones that work with them is to shape and mold them on the on the correct ways to fight. Um, but when you, like again, it's so many systematic things that they're up against. So you have some angry kids, a lot of angry kids are out here because they fathers are in prison. So I, I can go on and on to where we can get to the root of the issue and see how a boiling pot has been on a stove for so many years and now it just has spilled over. Wow. And this is where we're at right now. Wow. Elder Day, enough is enough. Uh, yeah. How y'all guys doing? Um, uh, one of the things about a boiling pot, if you lay a wood spoon over it, the pot won't run over. I think for so long they've laid a spoon over top of the pot to cause the pot not to run over. And now that the spoon is no longer on top of the pot, the pot has run over 
Uh, we're dealing with the prison to school pipeline. Uh, if you look at what we serve our kids in schools, uh, I was a principal at a high school for, uh, I ran a high school for 13 years. If you look at what we serve our kids in school, they serve the same kind of lunches in school as they serve in prison. Uh, they have the same behavior. They can tell you uh, based off of your third grade MEEP scores how many seats they need in a prison in the next 13 or 14 years. So I think one of the things that we have to step up to the plate to do is, is we're quick to, uh, we're quick to, and I'm not talking about us that's on the call, but I'm just saying people in general are quick to say, uh, is it our fault or what's wrong or what happened? Uh, this young, this generation is out of control. But you can't teach something. If you, you can't teach something, you can't reach. You cannot teach what you can't reach. And the problem is for so long, I call myself a medium. And being a medium, I'm, I'm, it's like a two-way street and you got lines going down the street. That's me. I'm that bridge between the old and the young to help the bridge to understand what needs to take place. You have young people who are, who are, who are in the streets uh, protesting, A, because, because they, 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 this is the Y generation. They, they, they want answers. They, they don't, they looking for answers and solutions mm -hmm. and, uh, and they don't care whatever, it, whatever it takes for them to get the answers and solutions uh, to the issues that's uh, arriving or plaguing us at this particular time. They're, they're willing to do whatever it takes. And so one of the things that I'll say is, is that uh, my wife said it best is a lot of stuff that we see is systematic. If you run, if you take anybody who has any organizational uh, skills and working with companies, if you remove their systems, then the company falls. So there's systems in place that to keep us in place so that things of this nature can constantly keep happening. So my question would be to anybody who says it's our fault, uh, let me let me take the same white police officer, take you home, homeboy, let you go upstairs to your wife room or your daughter room, lay her on the floor, handcuff her, then put your knee on her neck and let her tell you she can't breathe. See, so so the problem is, the problem is, uh, I, like my wife said, the problem is a heart issue. It's a heart issue. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we are we are now we're we're an unprecedented time. We're in uncharted water. And I don't believe that these people, I don't think that this is just gonna go away. This is not a common code. This ain't a common code. So, cause what you gotta understand, Staffy, is, is that when 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 America get a cold, black America get the flu. Mm. So 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 what happens is uh uh we 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 catch the whole flu. So they've been talking about a pandemic or a plandemic, however you wanna call it. Uh to, 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 to them, we've been in a pandemic. To them, we've been trying to survive. And so I think we're, we're at a point now, I think people are fed up. I think people are looking for change. I think people are being persistent in their change. And I applaud the young people. And, and again, I said this to my congregation and I'll say it again, that those are not our children out there burning up buildings. Somebody explained to me, how do you take a clean protest around the White House and you find construction bricks that was dropped off. Come on. Wow. We, 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 so, so, so there's things that, that are happening that mm -hmm. we're just not seeing. But I'll say this in my close. One thing that I love about young people, especially this Y generation, they, they're looking for answers and they want to be part of the solution. But because they've never been heard, everybody thinks that they're angry. Don't get my, don't get my passion mixed up with anger. I'm passionate about the color of my skin. I ain't angry about the color of my skin. I'm passionate about what I'm, why I'm out here protesting because I want to see change because you got somebody that's 22, they got a son that's three or four. He don't want to have to explain to his kid or watch his kid duplicate the same systems and processes that we're going through now. And so again, as my close, I'll say this, we cannot, we can't teach something that we cannot reach. And a lot of people are trying to teach young people, but you can't teach something you are, you're afraid of. You can't teach something that you don't understand their culture and their language. And uh, so th those are the things I get a lot. Of, I get a lot of flack from the from the Christian community. Y'all too urban. 
You shouldn't be preaching in Jordans every Sunday. You shouldn't wear baseball hats in the pulpit. Listen, I'm trying to appeal to a generation that ain't coming to church. There's, there, there's a generation that has not been raised up that don't look like what we know church to be like. And they, they, them, them the ones that God still got a call on their life. Because truth be told, don't nobody know what the woman uh, at the well looked like, but but we know what the text called. I'm done. <laughs> Sabrina, I want to ask you from the mental standpoint, because those were good. I know black people, we tend to internalize because we've seen the beatings, we've seen the injustices. White people tend to compartmentalize and say, oh, that was good for every, oh, well, that was terrible for everybody. And they don't want to recognize that we, as black, you told a wonderful story about your son having to defend you because of your skin. And you said, baby, talk a little bit about that mental part because uh, from your therapy uh, point of view. Well, the, the thing that's important is before I even get to the mental health piece is that we have to understand the historical context that we live in. Uh, 1619 was the first time a slave ship landed here. We didn't come here on our own, no way. We didn't even want to be here. Somebody brought us over here, and when they brought us over here, and we talk about the Constitution and all of that, the Constitution wasn't written for you. When they wrote it, they weren't thinking about you. At that time, we weren't even considered a whole human. That was written. That was written somewhere. And then in 1790, a lot of people don't know this, but in 1790, Benjamin Franklin petitioned Congress to abolish slavery. Mm. In 1790, that was a long before uh, Abraham Lincoln, and the Congress laughed at him. And then they immediately, in 1790, passed the Naturalization Act, which meant only white people were considered citizens. Wow. And they did that based on what he did. Yeah. So we, it's a thing about power. Power, when people have it, they do whatever they can to keep it. Mm -hmm. And so we live in a country where white men can kill hundreds of people. And they, they take them to jail with no incident. Mm -hmm. When you look at these mass murders that have happened since the 40s, they don't look like us, but they all go to either, they either kill themselves, get killed in a shootout, or they take them to jail and they convict them. Mm -hmm. And so mentally, when I look at that, I go, oh my goodness, why is it that Jeffrey Dahmer could eat up people? And when they go to apprehend him, they, they, he didn't wind up dead. They took him to prison. Right. And the right. prisoners killed him. Yeah. But the police seem to done. be able to apprehend without incident folk that don't look like me. But yeah. if I, and this is the thing that really gets to my goal about some of us, about us, is that I don't care if the band was writing phony checks. Okay. To me, writing a phony check is not enough to lose your life over. Mm -hmm. Whereas we have people that have in Columbine and Parkman and uh, the list goes on and on. We, they didn't seem to kill them and they had killed, they came to, to work and shot up the place. They went postal, as they say. All of those people, the Unabomber, they, they took him to jail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the young man that shot up the church, he, they took him to well, make- It is a structure that you read. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. My um sound be going out on me sometimes. So can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I will say this, that we first have to have the knowledge of our history. Most of us don't have it. And so then when we talk, we talk to people who are still in a place of privilege we have to understand that there is a cultural competence continuum. And at the base of that continuum is cultural destructiveness. And that is seen in people who want to annihilate other people because they don't look like them. Mm -hmm. So they create things like red line, which is still going on today. So you can have an 800 credit score and still not be able to move in the neighborhood that you want to move in because your skin color don't match the people who are giving out the loans. Yeah. Oh, I can follow up on the loan, but that's still an issue. So all of that is systematic. And yes, that mentally affects you. 
And so when you keep seeing that happen to yourself, to your children, to your people that you don't even know, but they look like you, yeah, it causes you to be angry. It causes you to have rage and it causes you to be uh, where you, you, you like that pressure cooker. You, you, you explode. Mm -hmm. And so you have to learn how to, one, control your own emotions. But I'm going to say this, and y'all not going to like it. Oh, y'all not going to like it. But we sit here as Christians when the Christian system was designed and used to keep you oppressed. Mm. That's a fact. And so when you have young people like my son, my son is 27 years old. My son will say, because he's a learned young man. He, he studies, he researches. So he said to me the other day, he says, I can't bank with white folks. So he, he closed said, his Bank of America account. He can't bank. He can't. He can't bank. He can't. I can't put my money in a in a white bank. He was banking with Bank of America since he was in high school. Mm. He closed his account and opened up his account in a black bank. He put his money where his mouth is. Wow. wow. Immediately, and then he. He challenged me. He says, okay, now you got your business account. I do have a black account at First Independence. I had it for a long time because I know the president. They're my friends. They, I try to support my people. But I also have a business account at Level 1. Well, this week, Level 1 got to go. Because mm. I can't be I can't be the model and I'm not modeling the thing that's going to absolutely impact change for people who look like me. Wow. And that goes all the way down to where I buy my food, where I get my coaching services from, who do my hair, all of that. Because we keep hearing that we don't support each other. We don't have unity. We don't. But I know folks that I support. Staffy called me, I'm coming. Yeah. Sherry called me, I'm coming. Yeah. Sunny yeah. Day called, I'm coming. Yeah. 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 And so we have to stop getting on the bandwagon of what everybody else is saying and be honest and open with ourselves about what our challenges are, about what issues that we really need to confront and we really need to talk about. And then to be real, oh, oh, I say this to the huh? within our own community, color is still an issue. Yeah. Yeah. So how are we gonna say we don't see color when we still see color? among each other. I still know people who say, oh, you're pretty to be so dark. Can I just be pretty? Right. Yeah. I got to be pretty to be so dark. Yeah, I'm dark and I'm fine. Mm, all this chocolate. I'm just saying. <laughs> However, <laughs> I say that because we have to model to our young people that I'm okay with who I am and that I support who I look like. And so I love when Sherry was talking about how uh, that she gets it two, twofold. You got the white people that they want you to do, do good and all this, and they expect all this from you, but then you have your, your sisters and your brothers that so, well, just give me a hookup. No, you shouldn't even expect a hookup. Right, right. When, when Sherry calls me and says, I want someone wants you to come and speak or whatever I do, I got to bring my A game. I can't go going, well, that's my girl, so I'm just gonna go any kind of way. I'm gonna be raggedy. No, I have to walk in excellence. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Yeah. And so I've modeled that for my son. And one of the things about a great and, 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 and you do do that. Yeah. I do that. You do that. Yeah. Yeah. I bring my A game to every game. So I told my son when he was young. When it came to being angry and it came to fighting, I used to always say, show me you can think because aggression is not something that impresses me. Animals and dogs fight. But the reason God gave us dominion over animals is because we have something they don't have and that's our intellect. So I used to always say, show me you can think. And so by the time he was about nine, he got kicked out of school and I couldn't wait to get to him because he got kicked out of school for fighting. And I said, oh Lord, what the heck? What? What did that happen? When I got to him, he said, Mom, this boy said, your mama is fat and black. And I went, ooh, ooh, ooh. wait, hold up. Um, he said, your mama is fat. At that time, I was 130 pounds heavier than I am today. So every scale that I stepped on, the, the weight that came up on the chart, it said 
obese. Obese is another word for fat. Yeah. So that was a fact. Then I said, you said your mama black. I said, have you looked at me lately? There's only about two colors darker than me on the color scale. So that too was a fact. I said, now let me ask you some questions. The fact that your mother is fat and black, does it mean that you don't love me? He said, no. Does it mean that I'm not a good mama? He said, no. I said, does it mean that that little boy would be the better for knowing me? He said, no. I said, so never allow someone to get you off your square for a fact. So the mm. next time someone told him that his mother was fat and black, he said, I'm happy you can see. <laughs> but the key point to that story is I had to be okay with the skin I'm in. Mm. Because I know some people, if you tell them that oh, your mama fat and black, the mama coming up there to find a little kid and she want to fight. Yeah. So we have to own where we are and use these opportunities as teachable moments. When mm. we were in school, White people was looking at me and said, oh, I ain't never seen nobody as dark as you and person before. And they wanted to touch my skin. And I could have said, no, oh, you can't touch my skin. What I chose to do was use it as a teachable moment. So mm -hmm. I remember the first time someone asked me, could they touch me? I said, yeah, you can touch me. And she touched me. And she says, oh, my God, you're so soft. And I says, oh, we can thank God for that. And she says, and so I asked her, how did you expect for me to feel? And she said, I expect it for you to feel like a reptilian. Wow. That somebody had told her that people as dark as me had tough reptilian skin. Wow. So because she didn't know, and if I had went off on her, that would have just kept the conversation from getting to a point of understanding. Mm. Wow. So I can't have an attitude because somebody don't know. Yeah. It's about, things, yeah, it's about being educated. Absolutely. There's some things about white people I didn't know. I didn't realize about the whole burning in the skin, you know, going and tanning and then peeling. I saw a girl peeling and I started crying. I thought she had skin cancer. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a whole other show right there. That's a whole nother show on why they want to look like us, but don't want to be us. That's mm -hmm. We might have to do that. Listen, I'm going to move y'all because we're talking about what should happen after the protest because people are going to get tired. Uh, people are going back to work. Um, people will not have the, the ample time that we see. Um, Pastor Hall, you still with us? <laughs> I think I got him because he, uh, uh, hold on. Uh, let me go get him. Uh, um, I want to ask you all, um, to um, comment on where should we go after this? Because hold on. Okay, where after the protest, what do you think should happen? What should white people be talking about to their families? Um, what should they be saying? What are you gonna do when you have the one white friend that comes and says, well, I have a black friend, you know, and they feel that they, that closer that they can understand about um, our culture. Uh, where will we go after this protest? Well, you talking to me? Yeah, yep, you go. Um, after the protest, I think a lot of things. Yeah, the protest, I have to agree with Dr. Sabrina that it was. It should be a teachable moment, uh, and we should learn something, and they should learn something. I, I actually had a conversation with a young man that was. Uh, white young man, 25 years old, um, I think it was Thursday. And he asked me some questions about, you know, what, what was really going on? Why was all of this going on? And I said, it's a lack of knowledge. I said, one thing about um, all of the stuff that's going on, the racials and the racism that's going on, it's, it's, it's a spirit of hatred that has been taught. I can remember, um, Sterling, when he started to school, uh, I asked him a question and I asked him, I said, Sterling, is there any um, white kids in your class? And he asked me a question, what is white kids? So from that, I, I, I took to understand that racism is something that's taught. It's, it's a breeding ground 
from house to house, from home to home in the um, in the white race. I don't believe that's something that people are born with. They don't just be born a racist. They're bred into that and they're taught to be racist. And, and you can tell in the older generation was very racist. They, they were people that, um, some of them come from under the slave, black people come from under the slave master. And these are some of the people's sons and daughters that are, are now even racist and haters. But this, it's a spirit that has gone out. And in this time we're living in, um, that this, that spirit has become stronger than ever before to the point where now the people don't even mind you knowing. It used to be hidden, but now it's not even hidden anymore. They let you know up front. You know, they don't um, care whether it's uh, you know or not. Um, had an experience uh, Friday. Um, I pulled from the gas station on, on Michigan Avenue, pulling out of Michigan Avenue. This guy came from around behind the truck. I'm in the right lane. He's in the left lane. He gives me the finger. You know, he sticks his finger so high in the air. Um, you know, I just ignored it. Like, you know, that's your finger. You do whatever you want to do with it. You know, but you don't play into everything um, or try to address everything that comes across from them. Uh, the teachable moment of it is, I believe, is that when you show the intelligence that you have, I, I always said the best way to kill something is to don't feed it. Uh, if you feed it, you're going to keep it alive. But if you don't feed it, it dies. Racism mm -hmm. is something that has to not be fed. We can't ignore a lot of things, but learn how to use it as a teachable moment and don't feed it to cause it to explode and your kids get into it and their kids get into it. And it's something then that becomes a trend that moves from generation to generation. So when we see it now, I, I really just think that it is a hatred, a spirit of hatred that has gone out and the enemy knows now how to stir uh, the black race of people is just by simply doing little crazy things. I'm not saying that uh, the thing that just happened with George shouldn't have never happened. It shouldn't have never been so. But we can't go after people because they did something like that. Um, there is a time in our lives as, as people of God and Christians that we have to learn how to seek God for answers and solutions. Um, I said before that when this whole thing um, started, how is it that where was the structure of it? Who who had the structure, who had the strategy to set up all of this protest and all these marches and, and the looting and all of that? Now, one thing about I, I often say is that you have to be careful when the people are looting and burning and stuff, because that person's building that you burned or you went in and took all of his stuff, he was insured. So now you empower him from the insurance companies to get more. Now he becomes bigger than he's ever been. So if you had just left his little stuff alone, he would have been still working at a minimum and not now having a majority or having a stockpile of stuff that he can sell to you. Uh, one, uh, one of the things we have to really use some wisdom in is am I hurting or am I helping? So sometimes when we look at, at the people of this, um, this rioting and, and the protest, are we helping or are we hurting? I think it's going to say it's going to be two voices. In some areas, we're going to help, and in some areas, we'd be hurting. So that that would be my um, my understanding on a lot of it. I'm going around, y'all. Um, you can just jump in when you want to. Uh, the the subject is so heavy, and of course, we are scraping the surface um, on this. But I just want to hear your take perhaps on what can we do? Um, because technically, if we just looked at it on the surface, it seems overwhelming, like this is never going to end or who's gonna be the person to stand up? I mean, we could even talk about, you know, I had a problem with some things Al Sharpton did uh, at the young man's memorial. I don't think it was the time to acknowledge Kevin Hart and all those folks. If, they, if it was cause of money, then if they donated, then that's what it should have been and nobody needed to be acknowledged. Because you start to see, oh God, I went off on a tangent. 
but but you you then start to see people holler out, what about the NAACP? What about it, it was not the time to be acknowledging folk. That, okay, all right, because that's gonna take me somewhere else. I'm gonna go around the room here. I'm gonna go around the room here, and I want y'all to tell me uh, your your thoughts, and I'll try to wrap it up. But I just had a problem with that memorial. Um, and I'll leave it like that. We'll, we'll do part six or something on that. But just get your thoughts together on after the protest, from your vantage point, from your expertise, from your um, from what you do, what you do on a daily basis, what can we do after? Because these young people want to know the why. They want the answers. They want to know what's next. Y'all can just go, whoever wants to go next. Or we can just go around the room. Um, I don't know how we position I'll it. I'll go. Okay. Um, I think what's next is, I, I don't think, personally, I don't think the protests are gonna stop um, because it is a global movement and it, may, it can stop here in the United States, but I think it's a trickle effect. I think it's gonna continue for longer than we expected or seen in the past. Um, because it has caught fire on a lot of issues that not only take place here in the United States, but it takes place in other countries, um, some of the same things. So I think, I think we may have sparked some stuff from it being here in the United States, but um, I think the protests are going to, going to continue until people see change, until they see policies change, until they see laws made, to they see people out of office. Uh, so I think the protest is gonna end, but as um, a thing to do, I think we need to get involved um, from, from the Christian to the, to the atheist. I think we need to get involved and we need to um, educate ourselves on the different uh, systems that are in place that we have no knowledge of. And there are a lot of organizations that have been doing this type of work for decades that many of us may not have been involved with and may not even be aware of. So I think we need to um, participate in a lot of things from the local level to the state level, um, because even on a national realm, we, we, we can't change things nationally um, until we change things locally and at the state level, because it's a lot of stuff on the books now when it comes to Michigan law that a lot of people don't have a clue of, that if our child get into a situation, um, for example, this felony murder um, that really happened that the guy should have been charged with in Minnesota and Michigan law, if you are there and a crime happens and you didn't do nothing or have nothing to do with it because you were there, you get the same amount of time that the person who pulled the trigger. So it's a lot of people in prison that are, um, that that law exists and they're in, in prison for life and they just happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. I, I, I know a young person that's 20, 23 years old went to pick up rap with his friend who went and picked up some weed from uh, a guy on the east side. And the guy on the east side he went to pick it up from, the boy, tried, he ended up trying to rob him and the guy shot him. But the young 22 year old who rode with him He's, he has life in prison, just like the guy who killed him. So that's a law that's in Michigan that a lot of people are not aware of, and that law needs to be changed. So I think we need to get involved with our criminal justice system, um, our educational system, all of these different things that have already been in place and that we, we need to not only protest, but we need to organize and mobilize in order to um, change those, those different laws and policies. So I think that's what we need to do. And there's a lot of information that is, you can Google, a lot of information that is out there, a lot of organizations that are already doing um, the grassroots work and would definitely need support and donations and all that different stuff. And a lot of people don't know how to do things. They can, you can donate your money. I've had a, a lot of um, Caucasian people reach out to me with questions. I don't know what to do. Um, can you point me in the direction of what I can do? Well, I can point you here. If you want to get involved, I can point you there and I can give you a list of 75 things white people can do to help racial injustice. I can give you that as well. 
and you can choose what you want to do or you can donate your money. So it's a lot of different ways that I think after the protest is, is, is over, which I don't think it will be, I think we still need to have boots on the ground and I think we still need to um, continue to do the work not only within our own community, but, but nationally when it comes to laws and policies. So that's my, my answer. Okay, all right, anybody else? I have not heard y'all mention um, too much of the God factor. I know we want to do policy change and march and walk, and but I got all preachers, all y'all preachers, some kind of way, some some kind of way. But I that's a whole nother show, Staffy. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> it is a whole nother show. It really is. And yeah, really I, I think so because. Just to that point, just to that point alone, I mean, the 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 church got the church got what black people do after they eat greens, macaroni and cheese, and yams. They got itis. Unfortunately, we still sleep. We trying to figure out how to get back to church and put it on the two and the four with all the extra stuff that's going on. But that's a whole nother conversation for a whole different day. We ready to shout when all hell still breaking loose. Yeah. So, but, but again, it's these. I want to get that out there, though. It's these hard. You know, I'm 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 real cutting edge, Steph. So I'm trying to. I'm I'm on the lease right now. I'm on. So oh, 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 I mean, it's, oh. it's, it's those hard conversations that we don't want to have. That's why that, I want y'all. Don't want to have. We 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 can't. We're, we're we're everybody talking about. I can't wait to get back so I can so I can bump. The hell with a bump. Who, who need a shout with all of this going on? You, you, right. you, Tasha Cobb said put a prayer on it, but Jesus showed us in the Garden of Gethsemane we need to put a... Tasha Cobb says put a praise on it, but Jesus showed us in the Garden of Gethsemane we need to put a prayer on it. So, so we, we, we're doing stuff totally backwards. We're, we're excited. We're, we're here. I'm, I'm done. I'm going to say this, and I might get in trouble, but I'm going to say it. We're, we're like a married couple. After you climax, you sleep. After the shout, now what? I'm done. <laughs> I, the other day, I ain't been there so long. I'm trying to remember what that's like. <laughs> okay, okay. We, we had to laugh somewhere. Had to <laughs> lighten that low, but you're right. The church, <laughs> the churches, yeah, yeah. Who wants to come after that one? I'll jump in. I'll jump in and just say that, of course, I am one who talks about educating ourselves and being knowledgeable and, and knowing our history and not just our history as Black folks, although Black folks' history is important, but we really need to look at how other folks have been treated over here, too. The Chinese, the, the Indians. Oh, my God, the Indians. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. They just, they, the Mexicans, they just took the Mexicans. Man. They just took it. They had a treaty with them and then decided, oh, they got gold over there? I'm just going to take it. I'm not even going to honor the treaty no more. They just, they just do what they want to do. Um, so education is important. But then um, when we talk about coming together as us, as, as a people of color, we need to support each other for real. We need to support each other's businesses because uh, I, 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 everybody know me. I, I'm a snack. I like snacks. I like snacks. I just do. I love a snack. I love Cheetos. I love Reese Cups. Yeah. Where can I go to a Black-owned place and get my snacks? Yeah. Where can I go to a Black-owned place to get my gas? And even if I have to go a little further or spend a little more, I need to be committed to that. Yeah. And so I think that we need to be really serious and have those lists like Sonny was talking about. What things can I do? Not just the white folks. What can they do? But what can we do? Mm -hmm. We need our own list of what things we need to do and that we need to hold each other accountable. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. important as well. Right. Kevin, Devin, Sherry? Whoever wants to go next? Well, Sherry, if you go first, and I'll come out. OK. I, I just ditto um, a lot that's being said. Um, I think definitely educating uh, ourselves. That's one of the things that, you know, I think we have to start with what our plan is. And one for me is um, I, I'm, I want to venture into getting a certificate in, in uh, diversity 
um, and inclusion uh, from Cornell. That's something that I'm kind of thinking about getting a certificate in there because I think that after this is over, there's going to be a moment for teaching. And mm -hmm. I think uh, my corporate background will give me an insight into being able to do that. That's one thing because I think we need to educate ourselves and other people. So I definitely agree with that. Um, the other part is uh, the financial. We have so much financial power that we've never um, really used mm -hmm. uh, in that. And I'm not even saying our, our dollar, our buying power, but just uh, investing in a black uh black owned organization or a black bank. That's something else that I think that I'm planning on doing is putting some of my money in a black bank. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's important because I think that that um, they, one of the things the statistics recently was how much money is being transferred to black, black banks. I want to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. I want to be a part of how we strengthen our community. And I think the black banks loan to black businesses more than other banks. So mm -hmm. I think that's important that we use, if we have a dollar, that we put our dollar in the right place. Um, and I think that's important as well as um, what Kevin was saying, that we start to try to build relationships and move out of fear and go ahead and have some of those conversations when we're allowed to have them. And mm -hmm. that, that means um, even in my church, I know that there are some things that I have to do um, that some conversations that probably um, that I've been asked to have that's kind of uncomfortable for me. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to go ahead and push through and have those conversations, especially when asked. I'm going to yeah. have those conversations because I think that um, if we can't start start some of these things within the church, what where do we start? Where do we start these relationships? I love Pastor Day's comments because I think that uh, we've used church as a hiding place and now it's time to expose some things that have been going on systemically for way too long. Mm -hmm. And so whenever we get an opportunity um, to teach, um, to love on our folks, our prison system, we know there's so many inequalities that uh, all of us, I think, honestly need to decide on three things, just three things that we're going to do differently when we come out of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they don't even have to be huge things, but I'm no longer going to do this, or I'm going to do that, or I'm going to invest my $50. All I got is $50 in my savings account, whatever it is. You know, some people have 50, some people have 5,000. I'm going to invest that. You know, we need to come up with some strategies that we can say, look, these are the five things I'd like for you to do. Someone's already said we need one day when we don't spend any money. I think so, because they they stopped riding that bus. That changed some things. Mm -hmm. You have to get their attention first. Years ago, that was one thing that they did. And just think if Black people stopped spending money for just seven days. Yeah. We would shut, we would get a whole lot of attention. Mm -hmm. So I love what he said about the church, because I think that we... Um, that's that's what we do. That's you know we we talked about July seventh. We need to start publicizing that. Hey, July seventh is our day, mm -hmm. and we're gonna do that, and we're gonna don't do buy it everything on the sixth. Oh, on the sixth, whatever day it is. No, I'm saying don't buy everything on the sixth. So you right, don't... don't go in and spend all your money on the sixth. Just don't buy. As a matter of fact, I feel like it should be a week. Yeah, yeah. You know, it really should be a week. And if we can't stop buying stuff for a week. Really, you know, and I ain't talking about buying it all the week before. Yeah. <laughs> Just do it out. You know, we do it out some stuff. So I love everybody's comments. I really, you know, um, I think that we just need to take an opportunity to make a choice that when we come out of this bondage, this pandemic bondage and this, um, you know, that we're going to not only march, but we're going to do some things. We're going to set up to do four or five things or three things differently than we did before all this started. Everybody got to do just a little something yeah. and maybe we'll make a big change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Kevin, Damon, or uh, Kevin, Devin. Oh, Devin and Kevin. How about that? <laughs> Let the apostle go. <laughs> All right, I'll go. Um, man, so much has been said. I I dropped a link in the uh, chat room here 
for you all to be able to have and consume. Um, a good friend of mine, David Johnson, out of Chicago, he started it. And, okay, because when this all happened, it was like, you know, you cut on the lights and all the roaches just begin to scatter. Uh, people were coming and they were asking, well, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? White people were asking. I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't, you know, they were saying, I didn't know. I didn't know. So he started, I added some things to it and then some other people added some things to it. And what this basically is, is just a, we call it the starter pack, race education starter pack. Because what I was finding is it became very difficult to engage with white folks having a conversation, an insightful conversation that was going to lead somewhere if we don't kind of have the same working knowledge. So at least it begins to put us on an even ground where we are having the same working knowledge about what it is that we're talking about. So it's everything from a podcast, a book, a movie, various TV shows that that influence heavy on black culture. So it allows us to, to at least begin as we're having these conversations, at least there can be some type of commonality in terms of working knowledge about how we're having those conversations. So they don't look at us like, what in the world are you talking about? What is just mercy? What is, why did that happen? So at least it provides a starting point for those conversations. I think the conversations are what needs to happen in a big, big way. Um, and we need to continue having those conversations. We can't stop having those conversations. Um, uh, I love what Sherry said in terms of just really kind of picking three things that we're going to do coming out of this. My wife and I, we have been talking about that very uh, intentionally about what we're going to do. And we're looking to have things just like this in a Zoom room where we can provide a safe space or a brave space for people to begin having conversations, uh, both uh, uh, blacks and whites, but but mostly whites, because um, this is a time where they are are inquiring to know. And let me just say this, because it's been said a number of times, and we really have to really lean into this um, uh, full well here. And that is, you know, what most white people know about black people is not what they got from black people. They heard it by way of other white people. And so now that this door has been open and it's allowing conversations to be had, we have to, I heard Sherry say she knows she has to have some conversations at her church. We have to be able to, you know, boldly, lovingly, honoring, but boldly lean into those moments and give them an, an opportunity to learn from us as we are learning from them. Um, you know, I, I say this to Kevin because I'm in a, very uh, same situation as he, you know, I mean, I grew up Church of God in Christ, you know, and I know the history of the Church of God in Christ. Well, now I pastor an Assemblies of God church. Well, I'm one of very few um, African-American senior pastors. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, I can put, in Michigan, I can count on three fingers. Here, here, here you go. You know what I'm saying? So, so understanding the role that we have when God sends us into various contexts and various situations, we have to understand fully well what that is like. But 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 one of the problems that I begin seeing is, you know, growing up in the Church of God in Christ, uh, my grandfather was a pastor, a superintendent, a bishop in the Church of God in Christ. Um, <laughs> you know, when I came over to the Assemblies of God and when they asked for us to lead the church and when we began going through, through the credentialing process, one of the things that was interesting, I've we get to the you know moment in the classes where they're teaching about AG history. And I'm like, wait a minute, there's a section of the history that's not even talked about. Like, like it's not even in the history. You can go on the AG website, it's not there. Like they don't even recognize the connection to the church of God in Christ from its present day inception. So I remember going to the instructor and asking, I said, and there's some things that are missing and and how because statistics even show that by 2023 the assemblies of god denomination will be majority african-american but well that's a problem when you begin to really uh, ignore the history of your african-american heritage and roots as an organization so in my role because i'm because i know and because uh, i understand my my position in it God is opening up doors for me to have further conversations. But, you know, 
I, I say that to say to this to you, Kevin, um, you know, do not uh, 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 shrink down when the opportunities are, 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 are presented to you. Um, you. You have to use it as a moment to really speak to what it is that God has placed in you so that you can effectively be that bridge builder uh, from one generation to the next, from one culture to the next, so forth and so on. So I just encourage you even in that, but I, I've enjoyed what I've, what I've been able to be a part of tonight. And uh, Staffy, I say to you, keep it going because we all have to face it. Yes, sir. Kevin? I tell you, if I went on this Zoom, I'd be doing about 18 laps around this room right now. Y'all have, I, I'm so full. I'm so full, I'm full spiritually, mentally, emotionally. Y'all have, y'all have blessed me so much just listening. And let me just share and, and how, how, how effective this is. Um, I've had about four, about five of my uh, Caucasian friends text me on my phone during this and say, Kevin, thank you for inviting. I've learned so much. Now, and we're going to talk later. I want to know what they learned. But this dialogue, and this came from two of them. I never even know. I didn't even know he was watching. But I prayed that the right people would watch this so that the proper conversations can take place. So mm -hmm. God is all in this, and I'm so thankful. Um, I just want to quickly, to, I want the young people, you know, to, to answer your question, I want to talk from the perspective of our young people, and I only can speak for the city of Pontiac because uh, I'm, I'm involved with the education system here, Pontiac, Pontiac Middle School, Pontiac School District. And when you say what, what happens after the protest, I need our parents. I need the parents of our young people to be parents for our young people. When you have a parent-teacher conference and you spend four or five hundred dollars on food and items, for you to come and check your children's grades, your academic success, and you have over seven to 800 kids and only four parents show up, wow, that's a problem. But when you put out a document that we're gonna take cell phones because they're a distraction to the class and you have cars lined up the street with parents protesting against the district, threatening to sue the district because you're taking my child's phone but we can't get you to be as interested in the grades. So, so how, how do we solve this? It's starting with our kids. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm familiar with the term they say, we're creating monsters. And I'm seeing it. I'm watching it in the classroom. We have kids in the sixth grade, seventh grade that don't know what two quarters equal. Mm -hmm. But they can tell you in a split second these games that they're playing. They know, they know how to strategize these video games. I got kids that say, if, if, if you went to the store and you bought a bag of chips for 25 cents and you gave the cashier a dollar, how much change? They say, I don't know. They had no clue. I have seniors, seniors that don't know how to write in cursive, don't know how to fill out a job application. Colleges that have come to Pontiac said, we'll give free scholarships. We'll give free, we'll give whatever you need. We just need you to fill out the form. Fill out the form and we'll give you the money to go to college. And guess what? I don't know how to fill out an application, but I know how to do TikTok videos. And I know how to upgrade my Instagram. I know how to do this, a Snapchat. Now, very uncomfortable things to bring up because it's, it's, it's making us look at our own culture. And so the change that we have to be is we, gotta, we have to give them something else to talk about. Because if they're saying that with the, if they say the pants are sagging, if they're saying that our kids don't care about education, if they're saying that all our kids do is walk around and listen to music, if they're saying this, then at some point we may not like what people are saying, but we can be responsible of shifting the conversation to give them something else to talk about. And so in, in that, my last thing, I grew up in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And moving back to Michigan. I now I'm thankful. I was really upset when I found out why I moved down there. But God had to, God knew what he was doing. But in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, that's when I learned what a community really was. Mm -hmm. My aunt could say, go outside. <laughs> and I said, I was like, why would my aunt let a young boy go outside and play all day? Because she knew whatever you do, it's going to come back to the house. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so in Hattiesburg, Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church, Pastor, they, they knew what was going on. 
the corner store down the street on Charles Avenue, they, they knew what was going on. Miss Ruth down the street, it was a true community. So there was no, um, you get in trouble and they ain't got nothing to do with me. No, my aunt would say, if you see Kevin doing something, you got my permission to discipline him and do it. And I grew up in that and I used to hate it. I used to feel like I was had secret service watching everything I did. But I grew up with those eyes watching me. So then I moved up, and that's why I think it's a regional thing, because I moved up to Michigan. Whoa, I'm watching kids cuss out their parents. That was unheard of in Mississippi. I'm watching, you know, parents, you know, all of the above. So we've lost. I, I like what um, Sherry said earlier about relationship, and somebody else mentioned community. Schools got to be stronger with the education system. We, got, we have to improve that. And it has to be more than just sports. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our kids can play chess. Our kids can go to spell and bees. Yeah. Our kids are very intelligent, but we have to expose that beyond basketball and sports, nothing against athletic, athletic events, but our kids have intelligence that's not being exposed or advertised. Mm -hmm. Communication. The fact that we can sit on this panel and have a conversation, ain't nobody cussing each other out. Yeah. Nobody's, nobody's threatening each other. Yeah. But but the at the African type of conversations without somebody getting off and threatening them. The church, my goodness. Pastor Day, I mean, he hit it right on the spot. And I appreciate that because that's that is what I'm hearing. Everybody's ready to go back so they can shout. We're gonna have an on fire service. It's gonna be on and popping. Why? Oh, we got our, we already got our songs lined up. But if this, if there was no better time for the church to stand up now, mm -hmm. to step outside of the walls and reach out to the community, no mm -hmm. other time. And then last but not least, life itself. We have to be real with ourselves. We, we are so busy, we point the finger at everybody. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, and you're wrong. Mm -hmm. what, what, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. How am I treating people? Yeah. How, how am I responding to negative things? Mm -hmm. How do I respond to other races? So you all have encouraged me because now I feel like I'm doing something right by not responding the way I really want to. Can I just be transparent and say that? Yeah. The way I really want to respond, God says, no, that's not the way to do it because there is a bridge that's being built. And so this discussion has been very helpful to me and I cannot wait to talk to some people that have watched because I want to know what they've learned so that these bridges can be built. I love y'all. Absolutely. Listen, I love everybody. This, you know, we can go on. I, I, I know y'all, uh, Buns is tired. I see you twitching in your seats. We've been on here a good little while. <laughs> and we could talk, talk um, a lot about that. We have it's so much, so much to cover. But I think if each one of us starts, uh, it is a great, great beginning. And I think ultimately um, educating our young people and listening to them. One thing I've learned is I had to learn to listen to my son and not just dictate, dictate. And what worked for me in the 60s is not working in 2020 uh, in terms of rearing um, the child. They do, you know, we got backhands for asking why. Um, but Sterling has no problem saying why, what you mean? He, he said, mom, did you do the research on that? You just going, you just, I say, well, my mama told me. He said, you didn't do no research. So that's where we are. And we need to um, listen um, to our young people because like uh, Sunny Day said, and they're out there in the middle of it, um, um, really, um, they've been out there a good while with that prison system. That's huge to me. And um, just what all of you are doing, the, de dealing with the multiracial um, churches, uh, Sabrina, praise God for what you're doing. You got a, a national platform being on channel two. And I know that they respect you. Our own pastor, Dr. Hall, celebrating 30 years as a pastor um, this year. And so uh, th that ain't been easy pastoring folk like me. So he's done um, an awesome job, him, him and my mother, um, First Lady Hall, who was keeping it all church on this line. She said, y'all need to be rapture ready. Uh, you pray without season. She's been quoting scriptures this whole hour and a half. It's, she's just, uh, she'll be on that church show for sure. Um, but um, we do need to um, listen and, um, and, and really try to help. Tomorrow, 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 um, Bishop Corletta Vaughn will be here. She, she was going to be on here, but she had so much um, uh, to say. And um, she said, Staff, you're going to read Willie Lynch. Uh, and I had never really read Willie Lynch. And I know why so many 
our kids was named Willie. And I really understand where the lynching process came from. It's if you have a chance, go and read the Willie Lynch letter. It, it it will make you sick to your stomach. I couldn't read it all in one setting. I had to put it down. Th thank God I'm off work mm -hmm. and I don't have to deal with no people because it really had me upset. And I could see exactly where that letter uh, is still active um, today. So if you just get a moment, um, just that first paragraph is going to set you off. Um, the Willie Lynch letter, 1719 or 1717, I believe. Uh, if you just get get a moment, just read that first paragraph and it's going to set you off. But, um, um, Devin, you want to say? Just real quick, you know, just as, as she called that out, you know, on that entire resource guide that I put in the chat, um, especially for our church leaders, uh, and Sabrina touched on it earlier about how, how Christianity perpetuated a lot of this. I've oftentimes said that racism is the church's ugly child that nobody wants to claim and deal with. Mm -hmm. But there is a book on that list called The Color of Compromise. The Color of Compromise. Mm -hmm. You have to check it out um, mm -hmm. because it is it, 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 it breaks down uh, racism and, and racial injustice within every denomination. Wow. I mean, and it walks it up. I mean, it's just a phenomenal, phenomenal book. Great piece of education, great literature um, written by one who takes very serious historical data and information and history. And yeah. so I just encourage you, you know, especially for our church, because that's my context. That's my world. I would implore you to start there, full of compromise. That's a great Thank point. you again, Staffy. Great, great, great job tonight. Great. If I could say one thing before we go, yeah. I, would, I want to just add something to what Kevin said. And um, I think one of the things uh, when he was talking about exposure, we, we push education, but we don't push exposure. We don't expose ourselves or our children to things that can take them further in life. We, yeah. want, them to go, we want them to go to school, go to post-secondary education, but I believe that exposure will take you further than education. Yeah. Because once I'm exposed to something, then I can see it from, the con from, from a different perspective. But mm -hmm. when I've never been exposed to anything, I settle in places where I really don't belong. And so I toil with this fact that I'm uncomfortable my whole life, uh, trying to figure out does life have more for me. And the only reason it, 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 it does, but the only reason that it doesn't uh, come to flourishing is, is because I've never been exposed to anything. I think it's our due diligence to expose our young people to a global society. Yes. It's sad when all our kids know is Royal Oak, Pontiac, Southfield. Yeah. It's our responsibility. For me, I believe exposure yeah. is greater than education. Because, yeah. because once, I, once I'm exposed to something, I want more. I yeah. want to go after more. And then my last thing is I'll say, I challenge all of our mainstream media artists. I'll say this. We want our young people to change. Y'all need to change the lyrics in your songs. Uh, we, we, we need to change the lyrics in our songs. Uh, mm -hmm. We can put up no fly zones in the city of Detroit, how we supposed to act, how we supposed to handle ourselves. But then you can't go back three weeks from now telling us how to, how to beat it up and, 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 and kill this, rob this, swipe this, drink this, pop that. We gotta, if we gonna change, change gotta start within us and we gotta stay there. And one mm -hmm. of the things, Staffy, I'll commend you on is, is what I'll say is what happens after the protest is left up to us. Because if the conversation die when the protest over, then nothing ain't going to change. Absolutely. It's got to be an ongoing conversation yeah. that we have to continue to have on platforms. Mm -hmm. Why can't we have this conversation on a Sunday morning and let that be the sermon? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. A conversation. A conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I totally, totally agree. Again, we can keep going, we can keep going, and we can keep going. What happens after the protest? Uh, after the protest, then what? And I pray that um, those of you who, who stuck and stayed with us here on, the, on Facebook, that somebody here has said something. They're all touchable. You can catch them 
um, on their Facebook pages. Um, just pull up their names and, and something will come up. You can go to any YouTube and find uh, any of them doing anything. If you just want to locate them, write these names down. They're all available. They will all come to your churches. They will all come to your venues to speak about whatever. They will assist you. However, everybody on, my pastor just dropped out the picture. I'm talking about him too. Uh, they are all available. You say, not me, I'm too old. Uh, they're all available to come and assist. I thank you. I love each and every one of you. You all are on the front lines. You all are essential workers, in my opinion. And you're doing an awesome, awesome work um, in your various areas. And we have people to look up to. So I had from um, the 70s, age 70, on down uh, to, to early 30s, I believe. And so we had we shared a little something with everybody out there. Um, tomorrow, tomorrow, tune in. <laughs> tune in tomorrow with Bishop Carlotta, eight o'clock again. And we will be dealing with the Willie Lynch letter. You don't wanna miss that. Um, I'm telling you, it, it, it just had me in tears. And when I realized that, I think it was the, the Levi jeans um, had the, uh, their logo was um, the man being pulled by each leg being pulled apart. I never even knew what that was, but that was part of the breaking down of the black culture in front of a woman and making her dominant over the, uh, over the, over the man. And they treated the man like the horse. If you could break a horse, you can break a man. And so they put the two in the same category. It is absolutely, and, and, and he said that if all of the slave owners follow these rules, we can keep them enslaved for 400 years. Here we are 401 years later, and that letter is still today. So I think this, this is a beginning, a new beginning of things. I'm going to ask um, Pastor Devin if you would pray us out. And um, those of you, thank you for looking at Just Face It. I'm back, baby. I'm back. Uh, look at, and I don't know how I'm going to be or how I'm going to do, but whatever I do, I'm back. <laughs> and we're going to laugh somewhere along the line, too. So, you know, I like to laugh, too. So, um, Pastor Devin, would you pray us out, please? Father, we thank you for the ability to have conversation and to have fellowship one with another. Friendship and fellowship, oh God, we, we, we thank you, oh God, for Staffy and the work that she is doing. God, I just pray, God, that you would increase her the more. Uh, Father, you said that when um, the righteous increase or when they are in authority, the people rejoice. God, thank you that we are entering into a season where uh, we are transitioning from mourning to mourning. <laughs> thank you, oh God, that we are moving from the state of mourning to the day or the arising of a new morning. So God, I thank you, God, that you're gonna use every one of these voices, every one of these pillars in their in various communities of God, not just in communities of God, but in various industries uh, to be change agents, to be agents of change, to bring about that state or that place of rejoicing uh, perpetually. God, I thank you, oh God, that what we're in right now is not our final destination, but that we will come out of this. Uh, as the songwriter said, there will be glory after this. But God, while we're in it, teach us what we need to learn. Uh, graduate us, oh God, to the next level so that we can come out better, stronger, wiser than we were before. God, I pray for everyone's health and strength. God, I thank you, oh God, that even in the midst of this global pandemic of this virus that has been going around, God, that you've kept us. Uh, safe from all hurt, harm, and danger, oh God, danger seen and unseen. You're protecting your people. And I think that you have protected these, your people, for such a time as this. And I thank you, oh God, that we will uh, be, I, I can hear the, the words of Mordecai uh, talking, sending word back to Queen Esther. Perhaps you've been uh, in the king's court for such a time as this. God, I thank you God, that we will not be silent anymore. We will not be on the sidelines with our hands under our legs and our mouths taped shut. But we will, we will lift up our voices like a trumpet in Zion and we'll begin to declare what it is that you are saying in the earth today in the mighty name of Jesus. God, I thank you, oh God, for even those that 
uh, participate in the conversation by way of Facebook Live. Got to thank you, God, that you're going to continue to uh, just do a work, do a work in us all, do a work in us all. And we will be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody, for listening and for watching. Oh, wait, 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 wait. wait. Okay. Thank you all so much for tuning in. With your host, Evangelist Daffy Butler Blakely, every Monday at 5 p.m., where we face life victoriously. It ain't on Mondays, but. <laughs> Till we meet again, y'all. Just face it. Love y'all. Love, Love you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Love you too. Bye, y'all. See y'all.